Uh, good morning, everyone. Well, welcome. Uh, <clears throat> my name is uh, Tushar Gohad. I'm a principal engineer at Intel. I, I work for their data center group, and uh, you know my primary focus is scale-out storage, uh, most recently with Ceph. So we, we're going to talk about um, <clears throat> a, a collaboration between AT&T AT and Intel on uh, high-performance storage, <clears throat> hyper-block storage in, in their hyper hyperconverged environments today. Uh, we, we jointly with at and we've been working on this project for about uh, you know, two years now uh, as, as part of a storage and memory work stream, which has been focused on the open ecosystem in the use of the you know, latest processor and uh, you know, flash memory technologies. So uh, to talk more about the collaboration, I want to invite Muryang Ra from at and Labs. Yeah, go ahead, Muryang. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Muryong Ra uh, in at and So I'm in the organization uh, in charge of the cloud architecture, strategy, and innovation part, so meaning so research activities in at and So um, before I talk about the, uh, the actual material, I would give my appreciation to Tushar and Intel team um, about this successful collaboration. Um, and I'm going to cover the background section, and then we will um, move back to Intel uh, people to talk about more details. So in terms of, we um, so started this joint work stream uh, when, as you can see on the, the picture on the left side, two executives, you know, handshake, and this, uh, the big, the six work stream uh, threads were created in, and in between AT&T and Intel. But this work stream is belonging to storage and memory work stream. And there are other work stream going on, uh, and. Uh, generating uh, successful the outcomes between two companies. And we set uh, you know, three high-level goals at the very beginning of this collaboration, so as, as stated in the slide. Um, and as uh, Tushar briefly mentioned, uh, we focus on open ecosystem based on this uh, open source uh, distributed storage systems like Ceph, Swift, um, um, and the latest and greatest and SSD technology and process technology developed by Intel, and how we um, improve uh, this the joint and the healthy open ecosystem uh, in a meaningful way. So uh, this uh, presentation will cover a fair bit of uh, the details of uh, this joint work stream. So I want to emphasize that in our executive summary, uh, so when we report our collaborative results to our executives, so we stated that the first, this is the first successful storage um, focused collaboration between at and and Intel um, in evaluation of software defined storage and new compute um, and non-volatile memory technologies. So I was you know, cautious of reading it because you know, this is very sensitive uh, statement. So we begin our collaboration. And I'm going to cover uh, the background materials uh, from this slide uh, using maybe three to four more slides. And why do we care about uh, hyper-converged cloud infrastructure? And, and what is it? Um, and after that, the key enabler for uh, the hyper-converged infrastructure design, uh, which is software-defined storage. So what, what does that mean for us? And uh, what is the, our implementa implementation strategy uh, of software-defined storage in this talk? And then you know, I, I'll talk about a little bit more details about our uh, hardware layout. Uh, and then, you know, basically uh, talk about the details further, going further. Then for those uh, of you who are not familiar with the terminology, uh, the, what is the hyperconverged cloud infrastructure, right? So it simply means, I think a lot of you may be fam already familiar with this term. It simply means uh, running compute and storage uh, component on a same set of hardware, right? So in at and at the very least, Traditionally, you know, there is a compute server on sitting on uh, you know, separate physical servers, and there is a storage appliances, um, which is uh, coming from different vendors, basically. So we have two different you know, physical uh, server types, and this is provisioned per application basis. So there are you know, many, many silos built in AT&T's infrastructure, and at the end of the day, you know, it's very hard to consolidate all those resources together. Uh, but, you know, recent advent of so-called software-defined storage technology, 
Now we can consolidate a lot of these resources together using you know, maybe a few types of hardware and construct a, you know, a cloud environment. So that's what we mean by the hyperconverged compute. And if you see the diagram on the right side, um, you know, this is pictorial description. So on the left side, you, know, you see two different uh, types of boxes, which means uh, different uh, types of servers. Uh, but now we could have the unified uh, the physical servers, uh, which allow us to optimize many uh, different things. So what is the expected benefits? Why we are doing HCI in our environment? Um, so we expect several benefits. So some of them you know, I put in this slide. So I mentioned the consolidation of server hardware, right? So by reducing, just reducing the number of uh, the physical servers in our internal catalog in at and since at and is a fairly big company, so just reducing the types of hardware saves us a lot of cost. So for example, in order to introduce uh, new types of hardware, you know, new servers or uh, storage appliances in our you know, environment, we need to certify, you know, which costs a lot, you know, more than you imagine, maybe. Um, and if you replace a certain part, if you have you know, 10 different uh, solutions from different vendors, it, it takes you know, a lot of process, processes and cost. And there is a loaded cost to test each of these options in different locations in at and you know, These are all cost factors. So reducing um, the number of types of servers are important for us. And not only that, uh, we, uh, based on our experience, the last two bullets, the better you know, workload distribution and better reliability uh, also come into the picture. Um, so we have the interesting experience uh, when we build a small uh, size data center around edge locations. Um, so typically, uh, these are just one or two rack deployment based on you know, a couple of disk arrays. So we tend to you know, um, deploy the appropriate disk array, hard disk based one in those sites. And if they are failed, so the entire site will go down. So that causes you know, significant problem for us. And now, so with uh, software defined storage solutions, we can you know, better distribute our storage workload across more number of machines, which improves reliability further. So that's our the part of the motivation uh, in HCI. So in the next slide, so I'm not just talking about at high level, right? So we are actually building our private cloud infrastructure based on HCI architecture. So the official code name, uh, you know, from the perspective of AT&T is uh, two things, the AIC integrated cloud, so which we call as AI, you know, AIC. And the other thing is network cloud, um, uh, which is uh, the more towards the uh, edge locations, uh, targeted smaller deployment compared to the AIC uh, the infrastructure. So primary applications that will be run in this infrastructure will be VNF applications, you know, virtualized network functions, or NFVs, network function virtualization. We can use the terms interchangeably. And since we have a fairly large scale, so nowadays in less than a couple of years, uh, in at and there are huge efforts going on to have uh, the unified uh, software stack with containerized control plane. So when I say control plane is in this talk, which mean, you know, this means the open stack environment as of now, that might change in the future. And from today to probably at the end of Thursday, you, uh, you have an opportunity to hear a lot of details about our the private cloud design, uh, deployment and architecture. So if you find the term uh, called Akrino, OpenStack Helm, Project Ocean, Airship, this is all related to you know, how we actually implement uh, our private cloud infrastructure. Right. So uh, to briefly introduce uh, terminology, Project Ocean and Airship will you know, prepare the hardware uh, resources and configurations to, uh, towards the OpenStack Helm. And OpenStack Helm, you can quickly deploy OpenStack in a containerized form um, orchestrated by Kubernetes environment. And Akarino project is integrating all of them together. Uh, so we aim to open source it sooner or later. You, you hear uh, from Akarino talk by Kandan uh, in other sessions. So the, for the purpose of this talk, the software defined storage that I mentioned in the previous slide, take a key role um, for building our AIC and NC environment, right? So essentially what we are expecting, uh, you know, what we mean by uh, SES in this talk is 
to separate the software piece from hardware so that we can run this software component on commodity hardware. These two aspects are very important for us because, you know, because of the traditional background, uh, relying on the um, vendor appliances, separating software from hardware, okay, and running on the commodity hardware. Even with the control plane elements like OpenStack and you know, tenant applications as well. And the, uh, the existence of the open source uh, distributed storage systems you know, such as Ceph enables us to boost um, you know, our execution. Right? Without those efforts, maybe it is a little difficult for us. But now it is a great opportunity for us to move forward. So AT&T is, you know, given the friend, you know, trend, so AT&T is strongly considering a SEV implementation now. So we have a very concrete uh, plan laid out uh, for this year and the next for actually deploying uh, the SEV storage uh, to support our infrastructure. So uh, I put some you know, use cases you know, underneath. So first use case is control plane uh, storage for AIC. So AIC is uh, for our large, you know, relatively large data centers. And the second use case is you know, both control plane storage, meaning OpenStack storage and tenant storage for network cloud. So network cloud, again, is for the edge computing environment for 5G infrastructure uh, and the IP services sitting in uh, the uh, edge location to serve customer better. And several other use cases are also under investigation, but this is our scope. So object storage and uh, the, the you know, media storage, uh, these are under investigation. So as a little bit of uh, more uh, details, right? So, um, so this talk is all about the SAP, all SSD uh, SAP uh, evaluation. So uh, before talking about this advanced configuration, what we are doing right now, uh, the planned uh, disk layout for our immediate deployment is all hard drive uh, based uh, OSDs, so object story daemon, uh, SAP, with SSD journaling. So SSD journaling is a, a kind of minimum recommendation that uh, we need to use. Uh, to satisfy our uh, tenant requirements. So our, diff our configuration is hard disk with SSD journaling. But in future, um, you know, just like many other companies, we think SSD will become our primary media. Right? So if you see the numbers, performance numbers, reliability numbers, almost every aspect of SSD is much better than better of hard drives. But the only problem for us, given the scale, is the dollar per gigabyte. Right? So in our scale, as, you know, we are not seeing a very compelling number uh, in terms of dollar per gigabyte uh, to adapt, to aggressively adapt the SSD in our infrastructure. But we need to prepare now, so that's the purpose of this talk. Um, so we all know the uh, bottleneck, the performance bottleneck will be shifted uh, from disk to somewhere else, right? So based on a lot of the data and efforts in the industry, so we, we know that. But in our setup, in exactly HCI, uh, with the configuration that we care about, what is the ballpark number, the limits uh, of performance? What is the reliability guarantee that we might uh, care about? And what is the impact to our running applications, VNAP applications? You know, those things are not clear. So we need a concrete data points to back um, we are really okay with you know, all flash SAP deployment in our environment. And for that purpose, we constructed two separate clusters in both companies. So in, in Intel side, we, we uh, construct a 10 node cluster, uh, has you know, very uh, latest uh, SSD, NVMe SSD as in it. So more number of NVMe SSD per node because the, we use the uh, latest Skylake uh, the processors there. And we construct a simi similar cluster in at and side as well based on broadware processor which is not very old, but you know, older than this highlight. Um, and you know, maybe the restriction there is just four NVMe drives uh, per node, but you know, overall configuration is very similar. So we did similar set of tests and compare each other to verify uh, whether the, what we are doing is correct. Um, so after this, you know, Kyle will share the details. Yeah. So. So I'm Carl Vimar, I'm with Intel, and I'm part of our uh, cloud solutions group. So I'm gonna go over, what I'm gonna go over is I'm gonna go over kind of the baseline testing that we did, and Tushar will go into some more of the details about how you can change that to get a little better performance. The goal really is, you know, to do any capacity plan, you need to have a good baseline. 
and you need to understand kind of what your limits are. But when, you, when we talk about flash, there's really kind of two types of flash on the market today. There's 3D NAND and there's what 3D Crosspoint, which Intel calls Optane. So that's our, you'll hear us talking about Optane a lot. It's what we call 3D Crosspoint. So they really fit into two places. There's 3D NAND, which is 2D NAND just tipped on its side, made into three dimensions, a lot denser right, for capacity. And that's where you'll notice the arrows going out into the hard drive space. The hard drives were really looking to replace there are the 10K SAS drives. Those, you know, what we, if you're trying to do an all flash or an all hard drive Ceph system and get decent IOPS out of it, you're gonna try to, most likely try to use the SAS drives and run up against the, I need a lot of them to get the IOPS. So we think that using a, a SATA or an NVMe based data or 3D NAND drive for capacity and then the 3D cross points are the, what we call Optane for caching and logging. So there's really two. So what we did, so and what we're doing is we're focusing really on, uh, we're focusing on RBD, right? Uh, RBD performance. In these particular use cases, these are hyperconverged, so you're, you know, sender to support uh, QEMU and KVM volumes. So we're really focusing on that. You know, workloads are pretty varied. They can vary from very pretty low lightweight control plane type workloads to high performance, very transactional latency sensitive databases. So we really wanted to kind of see where the edges were in the cluster and what the configuration was. You know, uh, kind of look at the extremes. High throughput and high IOPS, low latency. So the cluster. So the cluster is, is a pretty standard, pretty basic setup. Uh, there is 10 nodes uh, with a, we don't really show you what it is, but that is a 100 gig network in the middle. Well, oh, there we go. It's a 100 gig network uh, backbone with dual, 25, dual, dual port 25, so essentially 50 gigabits of throughput off the host into a 100 gig a top of rack network, 10 nodes, and each of the nodes, we've got the, uh, we more than 8176, so it's a pretty high, high bin processor, but in a high hyperconverged scenario, you're having to do double the work. So we wanted to make sure, you wanna make sure you have the ability, more cores, better clock, be able to handle that converged workload. And we're using the, you know, four, four terabyte, uh, what we call our DCP45, so those are a 3D, that's a 3D NAND SSD, no journals in this case. So what we really wanted to do here was set up a baseline system that anyone in this room might be able to go out and buy today. So we didn't want to use, you know, you notice we don't use Blue Store, we use File Store, right? A lot of, while some people are using it, it's still not quite to the point where everyone wants to use it yet. So we, just, we really wanted to focus in on something that you would build today, right? So Luminous, File Store, and uh, the P4, and the, with the co-located journals in an all flash environment, you don't really need the separate journals. You know, with hard drives, serial I.O., you can't write two streams to the same disk, so you need to separate it. With flash drives, they can handle the concurrency so you can co-locate those journals. So in this, now, having said that, there are advantages with Blue Store especially in having a separate logging drive. And in this testing, we did one OSD per NVMe drive in this first set of benchmarks, and later, Benchmarks, I think Tushar will talk about. You can stack up OSDs. That's the other thing you can do in a, with flash drives. You can use fewer of them. So, for example, you don't need 20 drives in a chassis. You can use four four terabyte drives for 16 terabytes of capacity and stack up OSDs on those drives. So you still get lots of OSDs to spread your load across. So these are the parameters we used. Again, like I said, let's look at the edges in the middle. So 100% read, 100% write sequential random, and then a mixed workload in the middle. So I'm just gonna kind of go through what we saw, the results we saw, give us a good baseline for what you can expect in a configuration like this. And these are your VM, pretty standard VM configuration for a test like this. So the first set of tests that we ran were your basic 4K, uh, would be 4K reads and writes. And you'll notice we top out, and this is the key, right? This is where we see the edge. You'll see at 50, I mean, it's, it makes sense if you think about it, right? 50, 50 VMs, these are 50, so this is the number of VMs, so 50, 100, 200, 400, 500. And then we just ramped up the test, we added Q depths and then ran the tests across. And you'll see they top out, it's pretty good, right? A million IOPS out of 10 servers. But as you add in, as you add more VMs, it pretty much flattens out there at around 750. And that's where we talked about bottlenecks moving other places. So bottlenecks not the drive anymore. 
the bottleneck tends to, is moving into, well, you'll see what with throughput, you can see it flattening out at around 35. But this is most likely running into things like CPU limits, things like that. And then on the right over here, where we're showing the random writes, same type of thing, right? Writes are always a little more difficult, so the, the top end IOPS is lower, but same type of thing. You see it flattening out as you go to higher Q depths. Now what we don't show on here is at a certain point, you're gonna start tipping back down the other way. You start to get too much contention in the system, you start waiting a lot, and your IOPS are gonna start to drop. So this is a pretty much a sweet spot right here. And 500 VMs, it's pretty respectable. You may not ever pack that many, but you can see you know, that gives you a nice range from 50 to 500. So, Right, okay, as you'd expect, mixed workload, guess what happens, right? The total top goes down, right, because you're mixing in your writes. So, but again, same behavior, right? We see that nice ramp up and then a flattening, right, at the, at a, the curve flattens there. Gives us a nice maximum. And you'll notice at 50, you know, 50 VMs, your IOPS are very high, like in that last one, which in, a, in an NFV, NFV environment, you may not be doing high bin packing. Right? You may want fewer VMs, but be able to drive that higher performance for each VM. So you're not always looking for maximum bin packing. So sequential reads and writes, you can see now that the, the parameters change. So the left is bandwidth, obviously. You know, if we're going sequential, large, large block sizes, we're looking more for throughput. And you can see we're tapping out around 30. And if you think about the network and what the hosts have, you know, the core, that core network, we're at about 35 gigabits, gigabytes per second. So that's where our network's starting to, starting to limit, us, limit us there. And you see the same type of thing on the sequential writes as well. In that same nice even curve. That, it's a little, that one's a little jumpy. And Ceph tends to be like that. It's a little, it can be a bit jumpy in, in the results, but it still has a nice, if you average across all of the tests, you can get a nice curve out of it as well. So then what we decided to do was, we were, this was on Joule. We wanted to move to Luminous and see what would happen. Because if you're gonna deploy today, you're gonna, most, you're gonna deploy on Luminous. There'd be no reason to deploy on an older version. We said, well, hey, let's look and see what happens when we move to Luminous with the exact same, exact same configurations but just luminous instead of Joule. So this is, on the left is random reads at a Q depth of eight, fixed Q depth at eight, and on the right are random writes, again, with a same Q depth. Now you'll notice about a 30% increase on the left there, maybe 10% on the right. So it doesn't seem like that's not that great. One of the things we think is happening here, though for that 30% increase, is we didn't change anything. But one thing that changed in Luminous is an auto, there's an auto tuning that gets turned on. So we didn't change our fixed parameters, but Luminous changed them for us. So we really think what might be happening here is we're seeing stuff itself. Because that's one of the goals with Luminous and moving forward is ease of, ease of management, not having to parse through I don't know how many lines of ceph.comp parameters and tweaking and changing, right? Because when you change one, it fixes the other. This way, we really want, they really want to be able to just turn it on and let it go and let it auto-tune to tell whether it's on an SSD or an HDD, for example. Now, when we really look at this a little differently, though, the third set, of, the third set if you look on the right, it's q depths, number of VMs on the right. And then this on the far right, that's IOPS. But you'll notice, if you go up just under 10, that's eight. So that's the line we fixed it at. So at that eight Q depth, there isn't that much of a difference. But notice as you start to go to higher Q depths, so higher concurrency, right, in Luminous, you almost double your IOPS at the 100 to 200 VMs. So, in a, in a, so you, at, even at 500, you're doing, you're, it's not quite double, but it's still better than that 30%. So you're seeing a huge difference in Luminous once you go up into higher Q depths. So that's again much better thread, a much better threading model. It's better able to deal with con concurrency in the system, which is a big, which is important for HCI, because in HCI environments, not only do you have all your disk I/O, your I/O coming through, you also have all the threads and processes that are being spun up and consumed in the VMs for doing other work, like database lookups and processing packets and things. So it's, this is very important result for us. And then same idea here, right, for your random writes. Again, at that eight, at that eight Q depth, which is kind of a mid-range, 
you see a, a bit of an improvement, but when you go to those higher Q depths, that higher concurrency, Luminous is much more efficient. So that's a good argument for deploying Luminous today rather than Joule. But then we would always tell you to run the latest version, right? No one would run the older version. And then this is just a, well, if you can see that very well, but this is CPU utilization. So it's a little misleading in the sense we, we say uh, utilization, but that's really should say efficiency. So what's happening is, yeah, the utilization went up a bit higher, but if you go back to the previous slide, we're doing a lot more work. So yes, we go up a, a little bit, 30% 30, 30 or so in, util, in utilization, but our efficiency in the amount of work Seth can do went up dramatically. I doubled my IOPS. But I, and I only did an incremental increase in CPU utilization. So again, back to that much more efficient threading model, much better able to handle the, the context switching. And then similar idea here with, uh, read, with the write, that's 4K writes. Again, much more efficient, better able to handle the, your concurrency. And then I just want to uh, hand it back to Muryong for a minute and to kind of compare some of their results that they got from their testing. Right, and thanks, Carl. Yeah. Um, so this slide, uh, so the, in the car's presentation, we now uh, you know, identify what is our limit uh, per you know, 10 node configuration and the CPU consumption and how the CPU consumption looks like. So this is the results from AT&T cluster. So uh, the technical document is also published. So you can search and uh, download the document and read it. And, we visualize the CPU consumption along with IOPS in this particular graph. This is one way to visualize it, uh, to gauge the impact to our infrastructure. So each point is one FIO run, five minute run, uh, with different block sizes. Uh, and we uh, use the x-axis as IOPS and y-axis as a, uh, the CPU consumption. Okay. So both read and write. So it is fair to say it has a linear relationship. So the IOPS is proportional to the CPU consumption. So y-axis is normalized CPU consumption. So this cluster has, for example, 648 cores. And among those 650-ish cores, uh, we could consume all the way up to 60% of those cores just for storage traffic. So which could be enormous. So may not be accessible in hyper-converged in infrastructure. So next, the topic that we want, wanted to explore was so can you control the CPU resources so that you know, we make enough room for our tenant to run while we achieve you know, the predictable performance on the storage system side? So for that, you know, Tushar will uh, take the details. All right, so, um, so let's talk about resource control and hyper condition environments. As, as Murang said, you know, um, if, you, if you let uh, ledger workload, you know, your tenant and your storage workload that's co-located uh, run unconstrained, you can, you know, even the Ceph OSDs can run up to 60% of the CPU, which may not be so desirable. Uh, if, if you look at, <clears throat> so, so there is a need for balancing the storage and compute resources in HCI environments. Now, if you look at the popular uh, hyperconverged implementations, uh, you will see that the storage CPU, uh, you know, is, is constrained at, at about 10 to 20 percent of the overall consumption. So that 80 percent of your CPU is, you know, budget is essentially, uh, you know, kind of left over to, to pack as many virtual machines or tenant VMs as you can. So that's the desired state. So, so there are two resource control knobs uh, in the Ceph world that you could you could do it <clears throat> in an end-to-end -end -end OpenStack environment. You could uh, have some NOVA tunables where you can set IOS budget per tenant virtual machine, or the other way to look at it is I'm going to constrain my Ceph CPU to down to 10 or 20 percent, or you know whatever the target may be. Uh, we use 20 percent in this exercise, and 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 you know leave the remaining CPU to run as many virtual machines as we can. So, <clears throat> so the first in the first uh, test in in this OpenStack environment we. We, we did the you know we used the first knob which was we essentially constrained um, you know the the per virtual machine IOPS 
using, uh, I mean, in this case, we actually did not use Nova. I mean, you could do, do this at the KVM level using Nova settings, but we essentially uh, used an FIO setting, which is rate underscore IOP setting in FIO, which lets you limit the number of IOPs a virtual machine would consume. And as you can see, uh, you know, the, these are read and write charts, or, sorry, read charts with IOPs and latency. And as you can see uh, to the left, uh, you know, with that cap uh, put on, you know, uh, essentially we, we basically uh, flatten, you know, in terms of the IOPS per total cluster IOPS are uh, staying at 1600 IOPS per virtual machine, right at about 450 virtual machines uh, for the entire cluster. Um, and, you know, the, the nice thing to note here is that, you know, for, for, for that whole range before the latency shoots up and the IOPS drop, you are you're staying under that nice millisecond number, which is which is possible with the you know because we, we use the NVMe backend and you know the highlight is that Ceph is actually able to achieve this even today. I mean we are we're working with the community on improvements here, but you, average millisecond for this sort of a density is possible. Um, this is this is just to kind of you know show show you guys like we had a Grafana monitor. Uh, you know, uh, clustered, and you know the OST CPU, which is which is essentially the green, the green chart, which is right under 20 percent. So this is just to show that you know we constrain Ceph, uh, you know the Ceph utilization under under 20 percent, and whatever you see, uh, the rest is essentially the the tenant VM. So there was there was still room to grow. So the bottleneck is, is, you know, I would say the limiting factor was the OST. So, so depending on how you, you know, notch it up and down, you will see, you know, you can support a different number of IOPS per VM or the VM density. Um, the, uh, again, you know, so, so we actually ran this experiment not just for the 20% number, but we, we, we started with no, no quota, which is what Carl covered. So essentially those experiments were, were with uh, virtual machines and Ceph running side by side with no constraint, right? So what we noticed was uh, between 50% uh, CPU assigned to Ceph OSTs and no quota on Ceph, you know, we don't see uh, any difference. So essentially you can, uh, so there's no difference between, let's say, assigning uh, both the sockets to Ceph versus one socket. So you can get by assigning one socket to Ceph and the rest for the virtual machines. And then, you know, from there, uh, as, as you decrease, I mean, decrease the CPU allocation for Ceph, your IOPS are gonna decrease proportionately. Yeah. The, the, the other, uh, you know, and this is more of an optimization in addition to the, to the 20% uh, or, you know, setting a quota on the Ceph side. You know, you could you could do a few things. I'm I'm, I'm going to run through these uh, two or three slides. Catch me later if you have any questions on this. But, but essentially, we we did a few things. You know, we we basically put, uh, you know, Ceph OSDs and and the storage and the NICs that they they, they would control on, on on the same side of, you know, the NUMA, uh, same NUMA I would say NUMA node. Um, and we, we also tried a, a, a thing which is essentially, this, this is called a uh, cluster and die technology which Intel's process have, where you, you have um, a way of partitioning your system into multiple virtual NUMA nodes by, by using cache partitioning. So where we, we ran OST on essentially one fourth of, of the cluster. So it, even this optimization is possible. And, and with, with these optimizations, you, you know, we, we basically we saw uh, you know, about you know, 16 to 20% improvement by just doing the CPU affinity and NUMA balance sort of optimizations. Um, there's one, one more theme I wanna cover here, which is uh, essentially <clears throat> uh, you know, multiple OSTs per NVMe device, uh, j just because the NVMe devices give you, I mean, you pay, pay for so many IOPS, but you're not able to utilize those with single OST per NVMe today. With, with, uh, <clears throat> and we are working on that, like I said, but uh, it's with, this is what is possible with, with Ceph today. So, so what these charts show is essentially, it's, it's, an, it's a latency IOPS chart. Uh, what we're looking for is essentially staying within a, a reasonable latency bound. What are the IOPS you can achieve? 
right? So, so the blue, the first blue line is essentially <clears throat> uh, four NVMEs, uh, NVMe disks per node, uh, 10 such nodes, and one OST per NVMe device. When you double the number of OSTs, we are actually able to scale that, uh, you know, much higher. And then what the other two charts show is that, you know, when you go from four to eight NVMe devices for maybe needing more performance or needing more capacity, uh, you, you know, the, the the, the performance doesn't scale exactly double, but it, it, it scales uh, pretty pretty reasonably well, keeping under under decent you know five sub five millisecond latency bound. So uh, essentially, you know, t today the the, tr the work around uh, for you know for the bottlenecks we have at the OST level for using uh, higher performance devices is to co-locate OSTs. So, uh, so with, with that, we are, we are actually continuing this work. Uh, we have been looking at uh, all this work was with OpenStack Mitaka, with Ceph 12.2, uh, Luminous, Blue Store, File Store rather. We are continuing this to, uh, to using Blue Store. We are, we are doing some experiments around iterative recorded block, block storage, which AT&T is very interested in. Uh, we, we have a couple of projects ongoing right now uh, with LibRBD caching uh, for the client, which may be which we think may be very useful uh, on, in the hyper-conversion environments. When you want, want to enable low latency use cases, you don't want to leave the node. Uh, you don't want to go to the network for, for your blocks. And then uh, you know, RDMA networking, as well as hardware acceleration for storage functions has, is, is one of the things we have upcoming. So, uh, so look forward to some, you know, some publications or, or talks you know, forthcoming. So, so with, with that, I'll, I'll hand over to Muryang for, uh, for concluding. So, yeah. yeah, perfect. So thanks, Tushar. Uh, so uh, this is last slide. Um, so uh, to summarize our uh, talk, so it is only beginning of at and CI journey with SEP. So as I said, we had a very concrete plan this year and the next uh, for actually deploying you know, HCI-based architecture in our you know, several you know, tens of data centers, and we'll see what will happen. Right? So, you know, we expect successful outcome, and in the near future, if we have a all SSD environment, this work will help us you know, greatly reduce the uncertainty of our planning uh, process. The collaboration between at and and Intel brings a great value. Obviously, as you can see the content, now we, you know, a lot of uh, the dimensions, we have much clearer uh, the, the uh, perspective so later, if we need to design anything in our infrastructure, this result will be used. And latest, you know, third bullet is a little obvious to all of you. The latest SSD technology enables low latency, high performance, scale up block storage by moving the bottleneck away from the disk. So this is very well known fact, fact and we you know, verify the known claim with very concrete number aligned with our infrastructure. Right? And substantial improvement in efficiency and scalability with Luminous release. And we expect you know, improved performance in later releases of Ceph, Nautilus, and other you know, later release. And storage and compute resources can be controlled with some trade-offs. So you know, Tushan and his team you know, uh, tried a uh, known mechanism uh, to show, actually show we can actually control uh, the resource along with the provision IOPS. Thank you uh, for uh, listening. And yeah, it's time to take some questions. Thank you.